Thank you. Uh, this petition, I think, is unchallengeable. The Greens have put in petitions every year since 1996, these independent nominating petitions, which is a big six-week project. And we usually get 65 to 70 percent of the signatures accurate. We know how to do it. In fact, I think the people here and the people, the volunteers, we could run the Board of Elections because we know as much as they do now. So now it's time for the debate to begin. And as candidate for governor, I want to put uh, Andrew Cuomo on notice that we're going to be talking about the stock transfer tax. Sixteen billion dollars the state collected last year and gave back. And then they tell us we have a fiscal crisis. If we'd have just kept that money, we'd add a seven billion dollar surplus instead of a nine billion dollar deficit. The bankers paid themselves twenty billion dollars in cash bonuses after we bailed them out from the federal level to the tune of trillions. A fifty percent bankers bonus tax would bring in another ten billion. And then we need a progressive income tax structure so the janitor at Trump Towers isn't paying a higher rate in state and local taxes than Trump himself. And if we had the kind of rate we had in the 70s, 95% of New Yorkers would pay a lower income tax rate, yet we'd have $8 billion more in income. You add those three reforms together, that's $34 billion more in revenue. The rich would be paying their fair and proper share, and then we'd have if you subtract the $9 billion deficit that Patterson says we have going into next year, we still have $25 billion. So we wouldn't be cutting the schools and the transit and laying off state workers and having a Democratic ticket that says we have to freeze state spending. That's a recipe for an endless cycle of depression and debt. When we have a recession, an employment crisis, 800,000 people have lost their jobs, 100,000 people have lost their homes to foreclosure, and they want to freeze spending. And we need to spend. So with that $25 billion, we want a Green New Deal. The Democrats, at least the leadership, have abandoned their New Deal legacy. They no longer stand for public spending when there's a recession. They've forgotten their demands for full employment and national health insurance, what we today call single payer, that they brought up in the 30s and got defeated on then and then after World War II in the 40s and then in the 70s. And now they don't even want to advocate for it. We're going to pick that torch up and we're going to green the New Deal. We're going to say that public investment should be in a green, productive technology so we can have a sustainable, green economic recovery that puts people back to work and back into their homes. And then we're going to democratize the economy. We're going to set up a state bank to finance cooperatives to build this new technology so the people have their right to participate in the decisions that affect their lives at work as well as in the electoral arena. So let the debate begin. And I look forward to debating Andrew Cuomo and the Republicans. And we're going to bring issues to the table that the major party candidates won't. That's why the Green Party is in this race. And we expect to get a lot of votes. Thank you. I'd just like to add to that. You know, after World War II, they gave free college education to the veterans. And then the Joint Economic Committee of the Senate and the House studied that in the 80s and found that for every dollar they invested in those GIs, it, gave, it, it contributed $7 to the national economy. So that was a fantastic return on that investment. Mm -hmm. Also in New York in 1967, the Constitutional Convention was poised to make tuition at SUNY free. And the big banks on Wall Street got wind of that. They told the Speaker of the Assembly, if you do that, we won't finance the state bonds. And when was that? 1967. Wall Street should not have that power over public policy. That's why we need a state bank where, so we can invest some of the money under public direction and set the direction for investment in our state and not be subject to the veto power of a few big banks. What we have had from no child left behind under Bush and then race to the top under Obama is privatization of public schools, High stakes real testing. estate <laughs> development going on behind that, like with Renaissance 2010 that Arne Duncan oversaw, called an education program. You investigate that, there was a lot of real estate development around the schools they closed. Um, and it was pushed by the business community, the Commonwealth Club of Chicago. You go around the country and find where they've had mayoral control or state control of city urban systems like Bloomberg has like the Lieutenant Governor Duffy wants, like the Democratic Mayor Minor wants in Syracuse, you find that every time you get that top-down control and disempower the elected education board, you find privatization, expansion of charter schools, and no improvement in the achievement gap that everybody talks about. Um, so that's one of the things where we're opposed to the Democratic ticket, which wants to push charters, wants to push mayoral control. And the th ir irony is, 100 years ago, the reform was elected school boards because mayors were using their personal control to hire unqualified people as teachers and administrators, hacks, basically political hacks in the school system, and handing out the contracts to cronies that gave them campaign contributions. Now, where you had mayoral control, we're starting to see that come back. So 
I just the Democrats and Republicans got a policy and it's benefiting the people that make their campaign contributions. Andrew Cuomo sat down in April with a bunch of hedge fund managers that want to invest in charter schools. And there's been exposure right here in Albany on how there's a tax credit and once they get it, they jack the rents up on the charter schools they built and then they're squeezing the charter schools uh, to pay that off so the charter schools can't provide the education they tried to. So there's a lot of problems with what we got right now without having to elaborate a whole policy. We have over 700 foreign military bases. We are occupying the world. And sometimes that involves shooting wars, but even where they're not shooting, we are occupying. And that's not about defending the people, the working people of the United States. That's about defending global corporations and their business interests overseas. We need a defense policy about defending the people, not about defending the profit interests of big corporations. We should bring the troops home from all those bases. We spend as much as the rest of the world combined. I mean, there's no conceivable you know, attack that any of them could put on the United States. We could have a much lower military budget, have full security, and then redirect that money toward what the people need. A clean environment, housing, education, health care, jobs. So, you know, we're talking about across the board. We have Cold War weapons that are fighting a Soviet Union that no longer exists. Those are boondoggles. We have, as a matter of policy, our only industrial policy comes out of the Pentagon and it's weapons. Uh, here's a figure. In the last five years, we've spent $77 billion on research and development on weapons and only $5 billion on research and development on clean energy. Those priorities need to be reversed. So, How much was that that you spent on energy? $5 billion. Since 2005 to the present, 77 military research and development weapons versus five billion for clean energy, renewable energy. So it's across the board. It's bringing the troops home. Uh, it's stopping the wars in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. Those people can sort their own problems out. Their civilizations go back thousands of years. And uh, things have got worse since we occupied in terms of the deaths. Uh, you know, on Time Magazine, they had that disfigured Afghan woman, which I think was an attempt to justify our involvement. But you have to remember that happened under our occupation and Karzai's government uh, instituted in their constitution the kind of discrimination against women that were supposedly there to stop. So I don't think that's the real reason. It's, it's about geopolitical positioning, it's about natural resources, and not about protecting the people of Afghanistan any more than the people of the United States. And I'm a former Marine. I'm for defending the country, but not occupying other countries. And I can give you a long list of decorated Marines, including Smedley Butler, two-time Medal of Honor winner, David Shoup, who was the Commandant of the Marine Corps, became an anti-Vietnam War, Daniel Ellsberg, Matthew Ho, who just resigned. I mean, there's a whole tradition of Marines who are about defending the country, not being imperialists. And unfortunately, too many Marines are learning about that by being, you know, occupying countries. I know, I know one kid who got shot up, another just got back from Marja, and, uh, you know, I don't think they're there defending our country. They're, they're just doing what they were ordered to do.